If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. If you'd like to acquire more customers, generate more sales with less effort, then talk to Sophie Barrington at Archer Creative, the first and only full-service equine marketing agency in the Southern Hemisphere serving Australian and international equine brands. Go to horsechats.com, search for Sophie, search for Barrington or search for Archer Creative. Now, while we're here, today's guest is Kate Fenner. Kate's been on before and she's talked to us and you can find out a little bit more about her background if you go to horsechats.com slash Kate Fenner. But today she's going to talk to us about 10 steps for bringing your horse back into work. How are you today, Kate? Excited to talk to you about this. Oh, I'm really excited too. I'm very well, thank you. Wonderful. Now, Kate, why did you choose this particular topic? Well, I chose it because it seems to be a lot of people. A lot of people put off um, bringing their horse back to work. And others think that even if your horse has been off for just a few months, that you have to sort of go right back to the beginning and it takes a long time. The other thing is people worry terribly, you know, if your horse has been out for a while, that it might bark or misbehave when it comes back. Yes. And, and so I just want to talk people through that and so that that really isn't necessarily the case and to see how we can cope with that and manage to um, avoid it. Okay, okay. Now, the first thing you're going to do is a, a very important question when you're checking the physical health and fitness is why was the horse off work? You know, was it off work? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave you to talk mm. about sort of the injury, the horse, the, the rider or whatever. But, um, yeah, talk to us about yeah. that first. Yeah, there's usually a reason. I mean, sometimes life just gets in the way and we all get a bit busy and the horse ends up standing in the field for an extended mm. period of time. But at other times the horse has had an injury. And so it's very important that we make sure that the horse is over that injury before we start bringing it back into work. Um, and sometimes, sadly, we've had an injury and that may or may not be the result of the horse, but we have to make sure we're also in a good place to be bringing the horse back into work. Yep, yep. I think that goes to um, physical health and fitness as well as mental health and fitness, which applies more to us mm -hmm. for the moment. Yep. Um, you know, we need – we often lose our confidence when we have a bad fall, and yes. that's completely natural. It's common sense telling you, you know, not to go and do the same thing again, um, which is why it's important that we don't go and do the same thing again. Mm -hmm. what, what are we actually checking with the physical health and fitness of the horse? Well, I think if a horse has had an injury, it's really important that you get your vet to check that it is 100% sound and ready to go back to work. One okay. of the things I see really frequently is a horse who have gone out um, because of a saddle fitting issue, so they've had a sore back. And that also usually leads to behavioural problems, which mm -hmm. might also have led to a pretty injury by coming off the sure. horse. So, Having the horse properly saddled by a professional is just so important to embark on any work with the horse, but especially after a break because the horse also might well have lost a lot of its top line. Um, I said popping a saddle on the same saddle might, mm. no longer, might no longer fit the horse well, so we need to check that. Yep, yep. All right. Now, the next tip you've got is the engagement zone, you know, to assess the horse's emotional and just their ability to concentrate. Yeah. We often make a mistake of thinking that if the horse might be fresh, the best thing to do is to run it around and get a bit of that excess energy off because mm -hmm. then it's going to be easier to handle. And I think that's a mistake because we think that energy is our most precious commodity. It's limited and especially if your horse has been off for a while, it's going to be unfit. So you're much better off really concentrating on engaging the horse's brain than you are pushing its muscles around. Um, and you can do that with simple pressure release exercises and positive reinforcement 
actually get the horse into the engagement zone. So what that means is you raise the emotional level a little bit, but not too much, and get the horse interested in what you're doing. It's like when you're you know, at school and you're, you've got one of those really boring teachers that speak in monotone and you're like going to sleep and you're just not engaged in the lesson at all. Then you get other teachers that scream and yell and carry on. And again, you're scared, so you're over-emotional and you're not engaged and not learning. And you get those wonderful teachers that tell stories and, you know, give you praise and really engage you in learning. And those are the classes that you learn a lot in. And it doesn't Mm, matter whether those classes are five minutes long or one hour long. They're the ones you remember. They're the ones you want to go back to. And that's the sort of teacher we need to be with our horse. Mm, mm. Yes, they're the ones that you look forward to. You know, it's not just mm, just learning yeah. a lot, it's looking forward to it, yeah. That's exactly right. You suggest starting small, bringing the horse in for a groom and a feed. Yeah, I think it's a, it's another problem and something, you know, that's a bit of a mess is that we need to work the horse for settling. Horses don't sense time like we do. An hour to a horse, you know, might seem like an eternity. Um I would start very small to get the horse used to just being caught perhaps and and pat it and praise, have a walk around, then bring it in, a bit of grooming, and you can build up. You know, do five or ten minutes the first day. The next time, come out, do a little bit more, maybe tack the horse up. It's a matter of setting up a good routine for the horse. And you know, we're the same like that. If somebody, if you want to embark on a get fit program, mm-hmm. The worst thing you can do is join the gym and tell yourself you go for an hour every day. Yes, yes. What you need to do is you go and you need to set up a routine. So the first week, you might just put your trainers on. The next week, you might put your trainers on and go to the gym and have a look around and come home. Mm -hmm. The third week, you might go and do 10 minutes of exercise. So if you do it like that, you're establishing really good patterns. And that's what we want to do with the horse. Don't overwhelm the horse. Just ease the horse back into work gently. And that way it'll still be fun. You'll keep the horse in the engagement zone. And as you said, the horse will be then looking forward to your arriving at the paddock. Yep, yep. All right, now the groundwork that you like to begin with, giving to the bit and the shoulder control. Yeah, so the giving to the bit is just a pressure release exercise. So just getting the horse into the engagement zone. I find that's the quickest and easiest way to get the horse into the engagement zone. And then I go from that to the shoulder control so that when I do get on, I know that I've got a soft, round horse um, that's you know, licking its back and using itself properly and I can control the shoulders. all really important before I get on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Good. Good. Now, you talk about a bubble of communication and groundwork being very yeah. important. So explain this bubble of communication to us. Yeah, I like to think of it as a bubble of communication. It's really having the horse in the engagement zone. So I use that give to a bit exercise to get the horse soft and round and in self-carriage. And if you sort of imagine it like a bubble – around the horse. Bubbles are nice sort of gentle thing that you know there's no pressure in a bubble. It just surrounds the horse. If the horse leaves the engagement zone, so disengages with you and starts to think about something else or or gets a fright, for example, what what it will do first is prick its ears and stick its head up. And for me that physically breaks that bubble. Mm -hmm. And so I know then when the horse changes its posture like that, I know, oh, gosh, I've got to get this horse back engaged with me and back into the engagement zone, into my bubble of communication. Now, that bubble, you can start building that um, in little increments where the horse feels safe. So that might be in your arena, it might be in your round pen, it might be near the stables. And you can take that bubble with you. And a lot of people sort of say, my horse goes really well in the arena, but he's a lunatic on the trail. And I think the thing is you've left your bubble in the arena. Yep. You know, you were yep. concentrating on the horse, you were asking it to do things, and the horse, you had this communication going. And then when you went out on the trail, suddenly you're just, you know, holding the reins at the buckle and the horse has to get on with it by himself. I think he feels a bit alone. Mm-hmm. Now, you talked before about the horses having its head up. What sort of um, body language are we looking at from the horse so that we know that they're in our bubble of communication? 
Yeah, it's really all about relaxation. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people look at the give to the bit work and they think, oh, well, that's dressage, you know, because they see the frame of the horse and the self-carriage and say, I don't do dressage, I don't need that. But it's not dressage. It's about relaxation. It's about safety. It's about keeping the horse engaged. So when the horse leaves that bubble, when that horse gets too emotional, you're looking at high things, so high tail, high head, high feet, so stepping high. And all of those things tell us that that bubble burst. Okay. The head okay. usually the first thing. The elevation is usually the first thing. Yep, yep. All right. Now, the next thing you're talking about, you know, after they we do that groundwork is to go into long reining. First of all, can you explain the difference between long reining and lunging? Mm. And then tell us why we go to long reining and not lunging. Yeah, sure. Um, I think we come right back to, um, you know, the first thing we talked about was the, the fact that the horse is probably unfit. And so lunging is great if you want to get the horse fit. It really is. You can, and you see it happening all the time, people running their horses around to get the edge off so they're not too fresh um, and it will get your horse fit. Long reining, on the other hand, will educate your horse and build top line. So the main difference is that with long reining, we've got two lines, one to each side of the bit, and we can feel the horse and see the horse. So we can feel that the horse is light in the bridle and we can see and feel that the horse is in self-carriage. So because the horse is in self-carriage and in a nice round posture, you're building those top line muscles as well as educating the horse. So long reining is a great place to get all your verbal cues, your transitions. Um, and when you can look at the horse and you can say, wow, you know, can I ride that? You know, can I you walk, trot, canter and get all your transitions undone? You look at the horse and say, can I ride that? And do I want to ride that? And if the answer is no for either of those questions, you, you just stay with groundwork and say yes. Okay. Okay. Now, you talked a little bit before about the fit and the educated What's fit and what's educated? Do you want to speak a little bit more about that? I think it's an important distinction because, you know, any work that we do with the horse is going to probably increase its level of fitness to a mm -hmm. certain extent. Yep. But not all work is going to in increase its education. The problem yes. I have with lunging often is it's often done in a head collar or it's done with one rein. Um, horses repeat whatever they practice. Mm. So let's say you, you know, stick your horse on the on the lunge line and run it around, you know, ten minutes before you get on because you're worried it might buck. Um, if it does buck on the lines you on that one line, you can't do anything about it. And it's also practicing probably going with its head in the air, probably bent to the outside of the circle, probably dropping the inside shoulder. Um, all these things it's practicing, all these postures that you actually never want the horse to repeat. So I think you're better off getting the horse to practice what you want it to do under saddle. So okay. I don't think it makes a lot of difference to the horse, whether you're riding or whether you're on the ground. If it's practicing what you want it to do under saddle, you're more likely to get that behaviour repeated when you ride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And you, you said before, can I ride that? You know, practicing behaviours you want in a ridden horse. Tell us about the behaviours you want in a ridden horse. And you talked about observing, you know, safely from the ground, which I presume is the the long reining. But we've got the long reining. Yeah. What What are you actually looking for specifically before you actually get on the horse? Yeah, specifically on the long reins, I want the walk, trot, canter, controlled and relaxed. Mm -hmm. Oh, relaxed. Um, with the horse obeying simple verbal cues. And I, I hear a lot, you know, people certainly bring me horses that they're just starting under saddle, for example. And they'll say, oh, I've done all the hard work, you know, I just need someone to get on it. And I find that a really interesting concept because if you had done all the groundwork and had done all the preparation, you'd be desperate to get on it yourself. You certainly wouldn't be giving it to somebody else. I yep. think it's the same bringing your horse back into work. So if you can see it on the line and you've got a beautiful canter, the horse is relaxed, the horse is being obedient to your cues, you're going to be desperate to ride that. And I wait for that feeling until I say, oh, my, so I don't want to ride that. <laughs> until I get on. Then I get on. I don't yep. get on 
ever and think, gosh, I hope he's okay today. Mm, you know, mm, it's mm. just, it's not worth the risk. I don't ride bucking at all. I can't. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now, you talk about establishing a routine. Do you want to go through the routine of what you do in the safe area? Yeah. So, in my safe area, so this is really early days when you're bringing a horse back to work. I'm lucky enough to have a round pen. I haven't always had one. Um, I'd, keep, I'd use any area where the horse feels confident, so within the horse's sort of comfort zone. And that might be your arena or round pen, or it might be if you've only got a paddock, it might be an area of the paddock perhaps closest to the gate. Mm-hmm. Horses usually yep. feel quite safe there. So wherever the horse is safest. And I'd start with the groundwork. So I'd start with some give to the bit and some shoulder sure. control. Yep. Then I'd go on to the long reining. And I'd go from the long reining to short reining, which is basically the same thing, but you're just a bit closer to the horse. Long mm-hmm. reining has a couple of drawbacks, one of which it's because you're such a distance from the horse and the line is quite long, it's very difficult to give the horse a full release of pressure with yes, that rein. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. yeah, and so that's a disadvantage of long reining. So, you know, after the first couple of times when I'm long reining the horse, I actually go to short reining mm-hmm. quite soon um, so that I've got a better release. Okay. And then, then go to short rides. So start off in your nice, safe area and, you know, I start off with a two-minute ride, bringing the horse back to work. It's been a while. Mm-hmm. And I increase that length of time riding and I decrease the length of time um, with the long riding or short riding beforehand. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats. Okay, and then after your short ride, do you do any groundwork or anything? Do you go back to that? Yeah, I often do. I often like to end with just a little bit of give the bit and shoulder control. Okay. Um, and quite often that might just be getting from the arena back to the stable or something like that. You know, so just sort just of doing the two together. You know, you've got to get your horse yeah. there anyway. You may as well train it while you you're doing it. To. Yeah, You might yep. as well. You might yep. as well. And you get yep. all that sort of positive reinforcement that goes with that, which is so nice, you know, because – with the simple groundwork I give to the bit, there's a lot of positive reinforcement in the form of padding and praise, uh, which is very uh, helpful for the horse, mm-hmm. keeping it in the engagement zone. Yeah. All right. Now, you said you had a round yard and you were in a safe area. How do we go about enlarging the area of work? You know, at what stage and what, what's the process of doing that so that we can get ready and there might be quite a few steps but get ready to go out for that trail ride get ready to work Mm, in the large mm. area or or a big paddock yeah i think you know we need to be quite inventive with how we break things down for the Mm -hmm. horse and you know for me the round yard's great i actually go from riding inside the round yard to riding outside the round yard okay yep i I still use the fence of the round yard because that gives the horse some focus and some stability that is quite helpful for the horse. I've then got an arena, which I I go from that to the arena. Um, My arena isn't fenced in, so it's just, it's actually just a marked out area in the paddock. So I tend to long rein the horse in the arena before I ride it in the arena. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really helpful for me because if, you know, if I've got it wrong and the horse isn't at the stage I think it's at, the worst thing that can happen is leave me on the lines and run off. Um, you know, I haven't been hurt. So I do the same thing actually with trail riding as well. I trail ride my horses around the property yep. before I actually ride them around the property on the long range. Okay, okay. Take, take them through the paddocks and into the dam and all of that sort of thing on the long range. Yeah, yeah. So really breaking them down to take away all of those um, potential problems, you know. You may not have problems. Right. You might just have potential problems. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then what do you do there about getting ready for the longer rides, you know, because you said you started off with two minutes. When does that get longer and, and do you increase everything? Do you decrease something, increase something? What's your routine as, as your riding time gets longer? Yeah, my routine really is to um, do less long reining and mm-hmm. um, more short reining. And the reason for that is we come back to 
the um, the fact that the long raining does desensitise them to a bit pressure a little. So um, it's better. The short raining is better uh, from that point of view. Although you, you know you can shot on the short range, but unless you're very fast, you really can't canter. Okay. Um, so yep. I do that and then increase my riding time as I as I decrease the long raining time, so that okay. the horse is becoming more sensitive to a bit pressure. Okay. Do you ever get to the stage where you just ride? Do you always do groundwork first? Tell us about your routine. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I always. Um, and it depends on the horse and how long it's been off. Mm-hmm. For a lot of horses, it might be a, you know, four or five day process until I just ride. Yep. Um, but I, I do always do, you know, a couple of minutes of give to the bit and some shoulder control before I jump on. Then mm-hmm. I don't. It doesn't matter if I've been riding a horse every day for 10 years. Yep. I'll still do that. Just to pop it into that level of communication, make sure the horse is engaged with me on the same page rather than just jump on. Yeah. Okay. Just okay. a few minutes. Good, mm. good. Okay, so that bringing the horse back into work, it's just, you, you know, you're talking about a gradual process, but you're making progress all the time, you know, and it, it doesn't, you've sort yep. of said, well, it, this is how long it'll take, yeah. So to get to the horse where you just come along, do a little bit of groundwork, ride your horse without long reining, do you ever get to the stage without the long reining, without the short reining, yep. where you do your yep. groundwork, about what stage, what, you know, how far after you bring them back into work would you be at that stage? If you've got a well-educated horse, yep. um you you do that in a couple of days. Really. Okay, we, yeah, Two or you three said days. that before. Yeah, um, yep. If you've got a horse that um, really hasn't got much foundation, you mm-hmm. might as well take this opportunity yes. to to establish that foundation and do the, do it over a couple of weeks. Okay, because okay. the horse is still being educated while you're doing this, which is really important. So you're getting a lot of education. So by the time you do get on, mm. um, you know, hopefully you've got much better foundation training than you had. Yeah, if you're ever feeling, you know, maybe the horse isn't quite ready, then you're probably right. Mm, mm. You know, you're probably right. Don't yep. don't get on until you really want until you're to ready. because Yeah. 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 All right, look, that was good. I think, you you know, you broke it down to quite a few steps, but but you're not taking months and months. You, you're saying, I've broken it down, but on an educated horse, it could take two or three days. A less educated horse is going to take longer, but that's that becomes not just bringing them back into work, but progressing their education at the same time. Yeah, yeah. and I think the real take-home message is don't, don't waste the energy. Yes. You know, engage the horse, don't mm-hmm. tire the horse. Yep. The tired horse isn't learning, and you know you've got a limited amount of time you can spend with that horse. So make it count. Yep. No, that's good. That's good. All right, Kate. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you for chatting to us again, and we will talk to you again. If anyone would like to go back and and listen to Kate's first episode, it's horsechats dot com slash Kate Fenner. Kate, if people would like to contact you, what's the best way? Oh, probably my email, which is Kate at Can Do Equine. Perfect. All right. And if someone would like to go back, listen to Kate's first episode and then just progress through from there would be brilliant. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for your time and thank you for coming on and look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thanks so much. Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.